Hello and welcome to the Jazz Jam Podcast. I'm your host, Dwayne Gunnels, joined by my co-host, Max Levy. And on today's episode, we're going to be getting into a kind of lesser known but fantastic album by Ike Quebec, who's a saxophonist and was the A&R for Blue Note and kind of one of the founding figures in Blue Note. So super excited to get into this. We've got a kind of a unique cast on this one featuring Grant Green a lot. So I'm super, super excited to get into this one. Um, But before we get into the album itself, like we do every week, we're going to do our kind of jazz question of the week. But since I really liked doing the trivia quiz that we had for Max, we're going to kind of bring something similar back and kind of do something a little bit interactive that I think y'all are like. So what we're going to do this week is called uh, Jazz This or That. So basically what I'm going to do, Max, is I'm going to say two things like Pepsi or Coke, you know, and you're going to pick and we're going to try to do it pretty quickly. So you're not like, it's kind of your reaction, not like a whole lot of time to think on it. So I'm going to give you two things that are similar and you're going to pick this or that between the, the two jazz things. So are, are you ready for it, Max? I am. And the obvious answer to your question, Pepsi or Coke is Coca-Cola. 1000%. See, this is a strong, strong disagreement. This is actually kind of, <laughs> it's kind of shameful that Max would say that because we were from North Carolina. So it's very shameful that Max would say Coke instead of Pepsi. Well, he's, uh, he's been in Kansas City for too long. It's it's apparent. I guess so. And you've always been a Pepsi guy. So that's been our little dichotomy there. It, it It's very true. I mean, Coke's not bad, but Pepsi is like, it's clearly better. But all right, so let's get into our own version of this or that max are you ready i'm just gonna kind of fire match you and just you know maybe take one second but kind of your your reaction are you ready all right i'll do my best all right here we go so the first one is organ trio or guitar trio organ trio west coast or bossa nova bossa nova art tatum or errol garner errol garner verb or blue note Ooh, uh, verb. Okay. Ooh, interesting. 50s or 60s? Ooh. Oh, man. I'm going to go with 60s. Okay. Uh, Kind of blue or I love supreme? Kind of blue. Smooth jazz or free jazz? Free jazz. 5-4 or 3-4? Three, four. Trombone or flute? Trombone. And the last one is Gene Ammons or Illinois Jaquette? Ooh, that's the toughest <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to go with Jug. I Gene do it. Ammons. All right. I put that one last for that for that reason. Yeah, that was uh, both of those guys are killer and are some of my influences. But um, I knew I that think... that one was going to be tough for Max. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, ultimately I really dig Jug, so... Gene Ammons all the way with, you know, a sincere appreciation for the great Illinois Jacket. Cool. There was uh, one, Verve kind of, that kind of surprised me. Why Verve over Blue Note? I do want to talk about that. Well, if I think back to my initial influences in jazz music, they were all the cats that were on Verve Records. Ben Webster meets Oscar Peterson is one of the first actual jazz records small group recordings i listened to and was influenced by and if i think about newer people that are coming out you know we mentioned the vocalist samara joy um on our last episode because she was a guest vocalist on a track from terry lynn carrington's record new standards volume one and so her new album is on verve records and i love you know what she's going for i just i just think overall the <clears throat> the the swing thing is solidified by the recordings of Verve Records. Also, the Bossa Nova Records with Stan Getz um, were on Verve, and I think Norm Norman Grants is is an essential player in the promotion of of jazz artists. And you know, we've talked about him before. So I, I just think an, a lot of my initial influences were players on verve records more often than players on blue note not to say anything you know disparaging about blue note out uh records because that label is such a i don't know big part of 
the jazz repertoire and jazz language and jazz recording. You know, you, I, I, I think you, you may have a good point that you're trying to make by saying, if you take away Blue Note, the label, maybe you take away too, too many, you know, inspiring jazz artists who had a bigger effect on the music than you would if you took away Verve records. I just think with me personally, my own influences were those cats on Verve. Yeah, that's an, that's it's interesting because Blue Note is so quintessential, but you think of catalogs like Oscar Peterson's, basically, I think his entire catalog is with Verve. So it's just, I uh, he was with Capitol Records maybe for a while too. Um, but it's just, yeah, that's that's a tricky question for sure. But it, you could, if you take away either from the jazz landscape, it definitely it changes things. So yeah, I was kind of interested to why uh, you you had said Verve, but that that definitely makes sense. Oh, one thing I wanted to point out is you mentioned Samara Joy, her album. It actually is Grammy nominated. So um, I haven't checked the full album out yet. I think that's maybe something that we should be uh, looking to do in the future because I know she's she does like some standards and stuff on it too. So. Yeah, it's very straight ahead, very, you know, swing oriented. I think it's got drummer Kenny Washington on it, Mm -hmm. um, who's, you know, one of the cats who's always been a fantastic drummer to listen to and has been a heavy player on the scene. There are a couple things I I would critique about that record. Um, I would like a little more stretch and there's no saxophone player on it. So (laughs) probably number one. That's right. But other than that, it it's it's a it's a really good first album uh, from her as a leader. That is, I don't know if it's her first, but it may be her her second um, album as a leader. But it's definitely her, her first on Verve. I'm it pretty is her sure debut on Verve. Yeah, and and it's it's all in all uh, a, a great recording, and she's going places. And this is just the first of many i think yeah well i think that's definitely one that we're gonna have to add to our our list um to for us to check out and maybe critique another one one the last thing before we move on is there might be some coltrane fans that are a little upset with your uh pick of of kind of blue over uh love supreme there max i know and i'm well, Train is on both of he them. He is on both. So that is like that is your one saving grace is that Train is on kind of blue. <laughs> um I I think also I think I agree though. I you know, I have to be in the right mood to listen to a Love Supreme. Yeah. I I think in and of itself it's it's a maybe more of a masterpiece and more musically mm-hmm. dynamic and interesting. Yep. But Kind of Blue had just a, a bigger influence, and I think the playing on that record from cats like Cannibal Adderley are, you know, those there's some just great moments in there that I can't deny, and to me that weighs a little bit heavier than what happened on A Love Supreme. Yeah, they're two of the greatest jazz albums ever, so I I felt like I was going to do put two albums against each other. And I thought that that was a good one to, you know, to really see what your, you know, what your reaction to that was. All right, cool. Well, let's get into the actual, the album that we're doing today, which is Blue and Sentimental by Ike Quebec. Um, a little bit of, of history on the album. Speaking of Blue Note and Verve, this is on Blue Note. And as I mentioned, Ike Quebec was the A&R for Blue Note. Um, so, but, you know, he recorded a good, a few of his own albums, I think four or so albums on Blue Note. And so this one was recorded on December 16th of 1961. And one thing that's interesting that we'll get into a little bit is that one of the songs was recorded in a later session with some different musicians. We'll get into why it was and why that happened. Um, But the majority of the album was recorded on December 16th. Um, In 2004, critic Richard Cook said that the album is likely... Quebec's masterpiece. It features some rare guitar, uh, rhythm guitar accompaniment from Grant Green, who's usually functions as the leader or soloist uh, in a group. So yeah, very interesting to have Grant Green kind of being, he's kind of like the co-leader, it feels like in all honesty, but kind of uh, supporting Ike Quebec in this. And we also get some piano comping from Ike, which is uh, pretty interesting. He does it during Grant Green's solos, which makes sense. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, 
later as well. But let's get into the personnel on the album. Max, why don't you give us the rundown on Ike himself and kind of what his backstory is? Yeah, I'd be happy to. It seems like Ike Quebec is kind of underknown. He's not that well known, I think, or that well mentioned. Uh, maybe a little underappreciated. So I'm glad we're doing a, a record from him. And um, if you don't know, he is uh, really well known as a saxophone player. And he started out on piano, though, born in Newark, New Jersey in 1918. And early in his life, he was an accomplished dancer. And as I mentioned, a pianist before playing saxophone in his early 20s. And he started recording in 1940 with the Barons of Rhythm, which is the title uh, of the group that Count Basie led. It's sort of a precursor to the Count Basie Orchestra. Um, and I found that info from Wikipedia and a couple other blurbs. I'm not, sh- I can't think of a recording with Ike Quebec alongside the Barons of Rhythm. It may be out there and it may exist. I just don't know of it. Um So I don't know if that's completely accurate, but I do know he was an on and off player with the great Cab Calloway. And he also performed with people like Frankie Newton, Roy Eldridge, Ella Fitzgerald, and many others. And he began working with Bluno Records as a talent scout and working to oversee the artistic development of recording artists. And this is what is known as an A&R guy. And that's what A&R guys do. And he was also known as a, a really great sight reader and uh, music notator and he often um, was asked to do impromptu arranging on many recordings and he performed off and on throughout the 1950s but did not record much as he was struggling with a heroin addiction and he did make a comeback in the early 60s late 50s with four records on the blue note label beginning in the early 60s And this comeback was unfortunately very short-lived as he died in 1963 from lung cancer. And as I mentioned, he he is underrated, underappreciated, but you'll see his name a little bit. He was on a couple of Jimmy Smith albums and also on the Grant Green album, Born to be Blue. So you will see his name a little bit, but he was, I think he was only 44 years old when he passed away. And he just kind of similar to Dexter Gordon when we t- went over the album Go, where Dexter in the 50s had struggles with heroin addiction. And I Quebec seemed to have the same issue. And a lot of players did at that time. So um, just just important to, to note that. Yeah, and I think it's, it's interesting to note that he died in kind of an era where he was we'll hear on this album like hard bob was really starting to develop and he was a guy who kind of was like really getting into that sound and we get a lot of that feel here so he died in what 64 in the middle of kind of that that hard bob movement so i'm sure there would have been plenty more you know records to come from from i quebec um so interesting to note there Yeah, it was in uh, 63 when he passed, but you're right. It's really unfortunate because we don't know where I Quebec could have gone because these four albums really brought him back into the forefront and he started to get that name recognition again. He was getting around as a leader um, and who knows where his music would have gone and how much of an influence he would have had later in his life. Um, So He's kind of the leader on this set, but as you mentioned, Grant Green, the great guitar player, is on this record and is more or less kind of like a co-leader on the album. He was born in 1935 in St. Louis, Missouri. Grant Green began studying music in primary school, learning the blues from his dad, yet he was mostly self-taught, just copying um, the music he learned from listening to records. He played some gospel and some boogie-woogie gigs before recording with saxophone legend Jimmy Forrest. And apparently he was hired on the spot by Papa Lou Donaldson when Papa Lou discovered him in St. Louis in 1959. Grant Green then moved to New York right after, started to record for Blue Note as a leader almost immediately after meeting Alfred Lyon in the early 1960s. And many of his albums were musically themed. 
Um, a great example is the album called The Latin Bit, where they're doing, you know, sticking to a certain style and doing a number of, of uh, songs in that style. Um, he had a little period of heroin addiction as well from 1967 to 1969. But then he came back to the scene with more funk and soul jazz influence. And he is sometimes credited with starting the acid jazz genre and movement. By 1978, his health had declined and he had collapsed in his car due to a heart attack in 1979, um, dying there in his, in his vehicle. And it was either before he was set to play or just after playing a set at George Benson's Friesen Lounge Club. Um, so uh, an unfortunate passing from Grant Green, too. Um, so a little tragedy there in the history but two outstanding players, I think. And a lot of Grant Green recordings were released after his death, posthumously, or were released well after they were recorded. So it's an interesting thing about Grant Green. Yeah, for sure. I think and one of the tracks on the album that we'll get into, Count Every Star, was recorded for an album for Grant Green, uh, Born to be Blue, and that wasn't released until after he died in 82 so yeah that's that's definitely interesting um the bass player on this album is paul chambers the very famous very well-known paul chambers he was born in pittsburgh virginia in 1935 but he grew up in detroit following the the death of his mother uh similar to myself he played the baritone horn growing up in the tuba in school so i i used to play the the baritone as well which is which is cool um, he took up the string bass in 1949, and he played in local symphonies and then moved to New York following an invite from saxophonist Paul Quinichette. And some of his influences were Jimmy Blanton, the great Ray Brown, who we talked about in Oscar Peterson's Night Train, and Oscar Pettiford. And he joined Miles Davis in 1955, and we just mentioned Kind of Blue. Paul Chambers is the bass player on Kind of Blue. Um, which is one of the most influential albums of all time. And then he played with Wynton Kelly's trio from 1963 until 1968. And he worked as a session musician for so, so many um, cats during that time in the late 50s and early 60s and into the 60s. But he had some health issues and he had some alcoholism and heroin addiction, as did the other members on this cast and so many jazz musicians in the late 50s, early 60s, that era. Um and those things caught up to him, and he died from in 1969 from complications, uh, including some organ failure caused by tuberculosis. And he was only 33 years old when he died, so just gone way too soon. We've, I mean, we talked about this kind of similar tale on the podcast. So many of these guys got mixed into to drugs and alcohol, um, and it was just kind of a, a culture thing in jazz and during that time. So definitely gone too soon. Yeah, it's it's sad to see he was only 33. I mean, yeah. my gosh. I think that's younger than when Charlie Parker passed. Yeah, and uh, he I mean, and he played on so many albums in that span like That's true. Yeah, if you look at his discography, 33 years old and still known as one of the best jazz bass players of all time and died that. So, definitely gone way too soon and then another cat who was is one of the most well-known um, musicians on his instrument is Philly Joe Jones. He was born in Philly um, by the name Philly Joe. So, cause there's also <laughs> Papa Joe. That's where the distinction comes from. And that's why he's Philly Joe. So he's Philly Joe from Philly. He's the younger of the two. Um, that's right. Papa Jones, very influential in the swing played with Illinois Jaquette a lot that we spoke of earlier. Um, but Philly Joe was born in 1923 as a kid, he was a tap dancer before learning to play the drums. We kind of talked about some tap dance in our, our last episode. He was in the military during World War II, and in 1947, he was uh, Cafe Society's house drummer working with all the cats, including Tad Dameron. And then he toured with uh, Miles Davis beginning in 1955. And he was a common sideman for so many cats after that. Uh, Hank Mobley, I think he, he's on Soul Station, right, with Hank Mobley? No, that was Art Blakey. Oh, da da da. Yeah, yeah. He's on one of the other that those Hank Mobley albums all have such different casts. He's on one of the other ones. Um Yep. So, yeah. Okay, cool. And um 
played with Bill Evans as well. He lived and played in Europe from 67 to 72 and would continue to tour with uh, Bill Evans until the late 70s and worked a lot with Red Garland and founded the group uh, Dameronian, which he led until his death in 1985 from a heart attack. So he was a little bit older, at least, um, when he died than the rest of these cats, um, but still kind of young when he died. So, Well, yeah, and Philly Joe is really known as being a lot of players' favorite drummer. Yeah. Um, I remember Miles Davis uh, reading somewhere that, that he said uh, Philly Joe Jones was his favorite drummer. So, and he's, he adds so much to this album and we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about that as we go on. Um, so as we get into the album, the first track, the title track is called blue and sentimental. If you don't know blue and sentimental, it's a song written by the great Cal Basie band leader, composer, pianist, and really we'll have to do a whole show on him. One of these days, there's just too much to go over with the influence and the charisma and the, you know, everything that is Count Basie to go into it right now. But him, along with the great Duke Ellington, those two are probably the top two jazz big bands um, that ever existed. And Count Basie's influence is, is just, uh, you can, is witnessed throughout this music. Um, it's also co-written by jerry livingston who was a songwriter and dance orchestra pianist as well as mac david songwriter and lyricist known for film and tv music uh, blue and sentimental was a song first recorded by cal basie and his orchestra in june of 1938 featuring the soulful sounds of herschel evans on tenor sax being featured playing the melody and that track also included the great lester young saxophonist on that record but Evans had the real feature and had the head on that. So everyone kind of really knows about that version of Blue and Sentimental. But there's a lot of great versions out there. Buddy Tate has a great version. Gene Ammons and Scott Hamilton. Also, Oscar Peterson has a nice version. So a lot of people cover the song, although not as many as I think should. So it's one of those ballads in my mind that is not really overplayed. It would be one I would like to cover on a record someday. Um, it's a very interesting tune. It's an AABA form, but the a but the sections themselves are four bars each, not eight bars. And so, really, you can think about it as sort of two different ways. You can think about it as AABA, where each section is four bars, and then the last A section is six bars because there's a, a two bar tag at the very end of the form of the melody or you could think about it as kind of a b a where that first a section is eight bars where you have a theme that's repeated and then the bridge and then the last a section that's six bars so kind of two different ways to think about it it's an interesting compositional um i don't know conundrum <laughs> but i i like to think about it as a b a because that there's really the the theme of the melody can be heard in four bar sections so to me that's the way to go there's some nice chromatic movements and chordal quarter note movement as well in the harmony of the tune and i love the diminished half step motion that occurs in the bridge so it's cool to listen for that um the tune begins on this track with solo guitar chordal syncopated motion and that's the introduction and then the draw the drums excuse me join in just after before the saxophone and the bass enter and i think that that introduction is really nice Dwayne. what did you think of that intro yeah i i love the intro i love how this song kind of sets the scene for the album and kind of gets us in the mood for for what's to come so i think that um yeah that that intro is really nice and just kind of gets us going and in, into the album you're right, and I think this is a great track to start with because you immediately understand what I Quebec is all about. You get his style, his sense of, um, I don't know, emotion as well in his playing, especially on ballads. He has a very breathy tone at times on ballads. He loves to bend notes, and his vibrato gets me every time. It's very, 
I don't know. It's not fast. It's not slow. It's somewhere in between, and it's somewhat unique, not in the fact that it exists, but in the fact of the way he's doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, his vibrato seems just a little bit more unique than I've heard before, and he has a great phrasing um, ability. He has these, the way he tapers off certain notes, it's very, I don't know, polished and professionally done. Everything he's doing is about style, Mm -hmm. um, I think. And we'll get into that more as we go on into the album. Generally, I think it's a bold idea to start off an album with a ballad. It's a little risky. Usually you wouldn't do that. You would have a ballad somewhere in the middle. But we can do that here because I Quebec has such a powerful ballad tone. This is a perfect way to begin an album with I Quebec. And I think he's one of the only cats you can really do that. And and really you can say that for, um, it's just laying out a nice statement of who I Quebec Quebec is as a player and what he has to offer. Um, there's thought and playful intention with every phrase he's playing. I love what he does at 127 where he bends a note effortlessly followed by vibrato and then chromatically moves downward. 126 to 132 is flawless saxophone stylistic execution, in my opinion. The solo starts around 140. He maintains an overall similar approach, yet he's a little less breathy. He's using chromaticism a little bit. And there's some nice diminished licks right at 219 to 220. I do that one, he does. Um, and he also has a nice overall, nice bending of notes. And there's really cool, almost grace notes he adds, little 16th note ideas he tacks on to a phrase. Overall, it's great movement. And again, it just seems a little bit emotional and it's effortless. It's just happening simultaneously and it's not choppy, it's succinct and um it's it's again it's all about style it's very stylistic again it's it's something that only a a few number of players that come to my mind could pull off all in all he just takes a one chorus solo and then we get grant green on guitar um to have a solo and i think grant green has some nice sensitive comping as well during the sax solo but overall um as we move on, the guitar solo, the bass moves a little more, and Philly Joe hints at some double time moments. Um, but they never actually go to double time. So that's an interesting thing to listen for during the guitar solo. And Grant Green actually takes two choruses, whereas Ike only took one chorus. And I I um I question that because the leader on the album is I Quebec. <laughs> um, it seems just a little bit too much for the for the guitar to go that long, but with what Grant Green is doing, he can he can pull it off because of his phrasing and because of his ideas. He begins with a lot of eighth note ideas mixed in with blues like inflections as he continues, and there's definitely more blues drenched playing as he goes on. But it's still kind of a note to note style. There's not much chordal playing at all with Grant Green's solo. He's very I don't know, sort of bop oriented where he's playing single lines. It reminds me a little bit of Sonny Clark's piano playing. Would you make that distinction? I actually, that is in my notes somewhere later on in the album is that uh, Grant's Green is super similar to Sonny Clark's approach to soloing, which is just very linear um, and has a lot of like kind of Charlie Parker bop influences to it while maintaining like the bluesy inflection. So yeah, spot on there, Max. I, I definitely, that's somewhere later in my notes. So good. Catch. Wow. Foreshadowing. <laughs> um, and again, with the bop from 445 to 454, he repeats a bop idea, developing it and moving it around. It's a cool moment in the solo that stands out as an example as of a great in the moment improvisatory development. And it works so well to um, just the development of the solo. There's some nice up and down ideas in addition to cool diminished movements during the bridge. And that final A section is most definitely blues drenched with a tasteful sprinkling of some great bebop lines thrown in the mix. All in all, great Grant Green solo. Then we get a shout chorus, which starts the same way as the melody does, but it goes into hits that are played along with the rhythm section. 
before going to the head on the bridge. And I think it's a very interesting thing to have a shout chorus on a ballad, Mm -hmm. which, yeah, it's another cool aspect to this first title track. Yeah. And this isn't like your prototypical ballad. It's not, it's kind of uh, has a little bit different of a feel to it. It is a ballad, but the way that they play it play is just, it just feels so soulful and like, I don't, yeah. So yeah, it definitely is an interesting choice to have the shout chorus on a ballad. Um, but this is not your, your standard ballad. It doesn't feel like. Right. And I do want to mention, you know, the sound of I Quebec is just capturing me at many moments mm-hmm. during this track. It reminds me of what you'd get if you combine Coleman Hawkins with Illinois Jaquette plus Ben Webster, and there's some hints of Jimmy Forrest. Yeah. If you, you know, if those four guys had a baby, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what we get. We would get I Quebec. Um, so I, it's, I'm just enamored with the sound and his vibrato, his soul. Everything is in there. The final section is is uh, of the of the tune is nice as it leads into kind of a rubato ending, and then there's a short cadenza followed by really nice chordal guitar hits and a bowed bass and some nice cymbal touches from Philly Joe, with some added ideas that I Quebec plays on top, and this is what I'm talking about. To me, this is the quintessential way to end a ballad, um, and. Not only do I like the added, you know, lick ideas that Ike does, but everything about the placement of where those things occur, to me, that is perfection when we're talking about ballad ending, you know, starting with um, a little short cadenza, then we get the chords from the chord hits from the guitar, then the bass and the cymbals, and then a little bit uh, sort of peppering from Ike Quebec right on top at the end. Mm -hmm. I think that is just perfection, ballad perfection right there. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that that's one thing that's going to come up often with this album is just that like kind of level of perfection and the intention. And there's so much intention and attention to detail with Quebec, with his style and his playing. And that's just those are that's really what stands out to me on this track, just to kind of you know, go off of what you said is his style. His style is so unique. His technique stands out. Um, his sound, his feel, we kind of get a, we get an idea for what I Quebec, I Quebec's all about on this track. And I think it really sets the scene for the album. Like I said, so I'm going to get into the next track and kind of some of those things I want, you know, kind of continue to go into some of those things that you mentioned. The next track on the album is entitled minor impulse and it's a minor blues written by Quebec. Um, it starts out with just a bass line and drums. And it kind of has, there's a cool like syncopated hi-hat going on uh, in the intro from Philly Joe. And I kind of like that. There's some cool uh, stylistic touches going on there. And it's an eight bar minor blues um, with its A-A-B-A. And so, and it has an, an improvised bridge. And the melody is repeated over the A section and it's played by the sax and the guitar while the bass repeats that that intro from the riff from the intro, which is kind of a common um, minor blues thing. It reminds me of the track Morris the Minor uh, with Jug and Richard Groove Holmes. Very similar thing. They kind of start out with a bass riff and then the melody is repeated and you get... Um, sax and organ on that one playing the melody together it, it, i that's what this song reminds me of initially is that that tune morris the minor um that yeah that's a nice connection that's a great album grooving with jug i i'm pretty sure we're gonna go over that at some point we definitely will go over that <laughs> we couldn't do it so early because people will just know like okay these guys love this album like that's why but it's coming um that's one of my favorite albums. But so, yeah, I, there was a very when I heard this, I, that's the first thing that popped in my mind. I was like, oh, Morris, the minor like this is kind of your minor blues format. So they stick to some of those um, common arranging techniques within a minor blues. Um, Quebec leads us into the first solo. And it's just all about the style heel here. He's light and soulful to approach um, the beginning of the solo. And like Max said, his sound often reminds me of um Ben Webster and Coleman Hawkins and he's like the kind of sultural soulful and sultry sound in the lower register but then like very commanding and powerful as they move up the horn and they start to open up a little bit 
Um, and just one thing that I think points this out is listen for the difference between one minute to one minute and 30 seconds. And then from one thirty to the end of his solo. So he's just, there's such a masterful use of articulation dynamics and the vibrato that's so unique to him that Max was talking about from one minute and three seconds to a minute and seven seconds. There's very light tonguing and a lot less air through the horn for kind of that sultry and easygoing sound. And then from 110 to 113, really nice dynamics through that line and the release at the end. So kind of just that attention to detail. Everything that he does feels so intentional. Um, every release, every way that he, at- he attacks a note and the way that he shapes his phrases, it all feels so intentional. And just kind of that beginning of that solo, it's very easy going. It's very laid back, but it's not like easy going and laid back in a sloppy way or like a lack of intent attention to detail way. It's very intentional. He's doing that all so well and so purposefully. Um, and it really allows him to kind of set up the rest of the solo. And so the next phrase, the articulation is a little bit shorter and more powerful from 113 to 120. And like I said, it's just really good ad- attention to detail. There's so much soul and blues in his playing, but it's very intentional and it never feels sl- sloppy at all. So yeah, then from 1:30 to kind of uh, the rest of the way out, um, 1:30 to 2:30, he kind of opens up a little bit and he sets it up so well with the beginning of that solo, kind of just letting that dynamic range show. Um, and then we get Grant Green uh, solo up next at 2:28, and right off the bat we get the kind of um, typical, unique Grant Green style and tone. He has a very kind of punchy mid-range heavy tone. Um, and I think someone, I forget who it was, quoted as saying what he would do is he would just turn the bass and the treble down on his amp and he would just turn the mid-range up all the way. And that's what gave him that tone. Um, I forget who said that, but one of his fellow players was like, yeah, he just turned everything down but the mid-range and turned that all the way up. So that kind of gives us that kind of heavy mid-range tone, um, punchy tone. And there's lots of blues licks and really good use of space throughout this solo from Grant Green. And this is where we get some uh, some Ike Quebec comping on the piano for the um, for the second time through the format at 312. Yeah, Dwayne, what do you think of Ike's piano comping, seeing as you're a keys player? Any thoughts on that? Um, on this track... So there, he does it multiple times on the album. On this track, it's it's cool, but it it is a little bit um kind of rudimentary in my opinion. Um, and it's a little, it's very rhythmic. It's not bad, but on this one, it does feel like you can kind of tell it's like the A and R guy or the saxophone player is like hopping in on the piano. But it's not bad, and I think it is cool. It does give a layer of dynamics. What did you think about it, Max? <laughs> well, I just wanted to see what you would have to say. I think you're right. This one um, is not as sort of, um, I don't know, impressive as it, some of his later comping. I think his comping on a track we'll get into later, um, Blues for Charlie. Mm-hmm. I think that one is a little more impressive, and I think there's more to say about his piano technique on that one. But it, it's cool to get a little bit of, of piano playing from the saxophone player. So he's literally, because it's a live recording, moving from his horn. So he puts his horn down. Yep. And then he moves over to the piano bench and, and plays piano. He might not um, have even put his horn down. It might be hanging around his neck still. And That's honestly, true. It doesn't seem like he's playing much with his left hand. It might all be right hand. I think you're right. He probably still has his horn on his neck uh, just sitting there as he's plucking the piano. Yeah. So, but one thing, it's not bad and it's simple and it's rhythmic. So it does what he's trying to accomplish, but it is, it doesn't, it doesn't give me much about like his piano playing in general, you know? So, um, but it is cool to get that kind of layer and get that, um, have a saxophone player doubling on the piano kind of shows his, his versatility. But then after Grant Green solo, we get into a bass solo from Chambers, um, which we get two choruses of, which is super nice because you might uh, typically just get one bass uh, or one chorus out of a bass solo, but we get two choruses here. Um, lots of riff based ideas, and Grant Green's comping is really nice on the solo. And then we go back into another Ike solo before the head out, and that's a really nice touch. Um, I really like the 
repeated ideas that he does on the way back into a solo. And then there's just a, a lot of good use of repetition, bop lines, and just that soulful range on the horn that we were talking about from that kind of lower end sultry sound to that more higher end, um, powerful commanding sound and kind of uh, belting as he gets up on the horn. And the head out is pretty standard um, as to what you do on a minor blues. And then they vamp on kind of the one chord on the way out. And that's just kind of, that's what you'd expect from this kind of tune. So, but all in all, this is, it's cool to get a minor blues. It's kind of this album so versatile. So it's cool to get a, a minor blues and this album is very blues drenched. So it, it did, it wouldn't feel right if there weren't a minor blues on a, a very blues heavy album. I also think they start to groove a little harder when I comes back in after the bass solo. Yeah. It's, it's a little more driving and energetic, um, which the first half of the track wasn't quite as energetic, but it was intentional as you pointed out and it's great music going on, but I just, there, there's more drive from the drums, especially, and from the ideas Ike is playing off of and everything felt really good. And it was swinging super hard. And it was kind of more like a shuffle beat um, mm-hmm. yeah. a- a- after that bass solo. Mm-hmm. So it, to me, that's a, that's a, I don't know, sort of line of demarcation <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, at that point uh, where you're crossing over into the really groove yeah. section. I don't know. Heavy groove part, part of the tune. Yeah, to kind of open it up and, and let Ike really, you know, really go. That's right. Uh, the next track on the album is a ballad, Don't Take Your Love From Me. This was a pop song first published in 1941, written by Henry Nemo, songwriter and lyricist and actor, born in 1909. He was kind of known as a Hollywood hipster. He also had his own band in the early 40s, featuring four Chinese women vocalists. It was a very large group. And his first compositional hit was the tune, I Let a Song Go Out of My Heart. And he also wrote the song Tis Autumn. He worked alongside greats, including Frank Sinatra, Duke Ellington, Lena Horne, Artie Shaw, and many others. Apparently, also interesting fact about Henry Nemo, he was the inspiration for the star-kissed tuna advertising mascot named Charlie the Tuna. <laughs> so he is... <laughs> he, Henry Nemo was the real life inspiration of Charlie the Tuna. Apparently they based some of the, you know, like the the image of the hair and the glasses and just the overall personality of Charlie the Tuna on this cat Henry Nemo. Um so and the and Starkist is using Charlie the Tuna again. They used him up until the 80s and then they kind of did away with him, and then they've been bringing him back ever since the late '90s, early 2000s. All right, I'm looking um, at Charlie the Tuna, and I'm gonna. What? I gotta look at. I got, and I gotta look yeah. at Henry Nemo. Okay, Charlie the Tuna. Okay, he's what I remember him looking like. Yes, Henry Nemo. I got it. This is. This I don't know about the appearance, but I know they based just sort of the character of Charlie the Tuna. On Henry Nemo, apparently Henry Nemo was a real character, and so they turned him into a character. <laughs> that is hilarious. I can see the the similarities. There's a picture of him wearing kind of that hat and the glasses in his older age. That's wild. What? That's so random that he's the the face of because we all everyone's bought a a can of tuna and put it on a sandwich. So that is a, a crazy connection there, Max. Yeah, every time you buy some tuna, Henry Nemo is looking at you. <laughs> yeah, think of this tune. <laughs> <laughs> yep anyway he, he he was just kind of a an interesting dude kind of a hipster cat always kind of you know you always saw him saw him around it seemed like um whether he was supposed to be there or not is what i i gather from reading <laughs> about him um but an interesting cat who wrote this this tune don't take your love from me and i think this treatment of the song is is pretty cool they start with nice chordal uh, guitar intro again similar to the start of the first tune blue and sentimental yet there's a little bit more smoothness to grant green's playing here and it's a little more um consistent i think as an introduction it's laying out the beat a little more um clearly before the saxophone enters it's sort of a 16 bar a and a prime form so 32 bars all together and there's a number of cool harmonic movements in this tune, a number of different times where it moves chromatically. 
I think I Quebec has some nice tubby sounds going on. There's an easiness in his sound, effortlessness, as we've mentioned. His approach to the melody is superb. He has quite a few embellishments and some nice melismatic additions and syncopations to the melody. And there's also nice bending at 228. And those bends are the epitome of I Quebec style. There's also some nice noticeable musically appropriate reverb that's going on in the mix at times on certain saxophone notes. So you can hear that in moments during this ballad. Um, the bass gets a little busier and then at the sax bend at that 228 mark, and that sets up sort of the double time feel for the guitar solo. So the guitar has the solo on this one. I want to go back to something that you said um, just a, a second earlier with the reverb. That's one yeah. thing that really stood out to me on this album is that there's a, a significant amount of reverb on Ike Quebec's saxophone and more than you would typically hear from an album of this period. What are what are your thoughts on that? And do you like because I know that sometimes you are picky about reverb um, when we'll play a gig and a, a sound guy will try to put reverb. You're just like, I want my saxophone to sound. So what are your thoughts on the reverb here and the use of it? by van gelder and you know the production here what because i i know that this is kind of an interesting topic here for saxophone players that is a great question um honestly i'm not as well versed in those sorts of things as i should be i will say generally i don't want too much reverb and i think you can have too much reverb on a saxophone i don't like effects i don't like the pedals I don't like, uh, it's not reverb, but uh, what's, what's the other I don't other like thing anything that... modern. <laughs> I don't... Pitch benders, I don't know. There's some like wah-wah pedals. People do all kinds of things with saxophones now. Max is like, yeah, give me a microphone. Yeah, it's called a microphone, and, and I'll do what I want to do on my instrument. Thank you. It's a naturally occurring acoustic instrument. I can make my own sounds. I don't need any <laughs> delay or any anything you want to do to me. I don't want it. I'm going to do it to myself. I think Max music. is in Kansas City and not in like L.A. or somewhere like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if they really wanted it, I would let them do it, but I would not be happy. So I would be holding a lot in, I guess, is what I would say. Um, I, I think those moments here with the reverb actually work well and work to the advantage of the overall sound because on the on certain moments on ballads, you can also hear that on the album boss tenor from gene ammons on on many kind of just on the endings of phrases where you know you hold out a longer note or you just you just articulate a note a certain way and then it reverbs from there i think those moments are awesome but i i don't want too much reverb on everything and i think that there's like a very kind of on this one there's kind of a natural feel to the reverb and for me if it sounds like natural, like, oh, like it just sounds like he's playing in like a large room or a church. I think that that's cool versus like more like a delay or like reverb that doesn't sound su super natural. So I think there's definitely some nuance to it. And um, there's definitely times where it's appropriate to have more reverb. And I think it fits with Ike's playing. But I was yeah, I was interested to get your opinion on because I know that it can be kind of a a personal you know, stylistic choice from saxophone player to saxophone player. You're right. And I think generally when I, when I am hesitant of reverb, I get, I do that because I get the sense that they're just going to do too much mm -hmm. and they're going to add too much reverb. So what I should say is just a little reverb, which I have told people that before. Um, but I think there can be way too much. And especially if you're playing faster tunes or, or you're playing faster lines, or reverb staccato, is, and then there's like reverb, and that's like that. Doesn't, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's not going to match. It's going to get in the way of your music. Uh, it's going to get in the way of what you're playing on the horn, and uh, that is too much for me. And uh, I I want to be able to control that myself as a as a saxophone player. I can, you know, I can manipulate what I'm doing a little bit with the endings of phrases. Or if I really want to, you know, project a little bit more on certain notes and others. And and I think jazz articulation allows for that flexibility to occur. 
I think one thing that's interesting to note before we move on um, and like get on with the rest of the song is that a lot of this could have been done. It probably was done in more of like a post-production setting. So it's possible that Ike did have a hand in like, cause there are times when there's way more reverb than other times on the album. So it's not to say that Ike wasn't the one and he was an A&R. He was around in so many recording sessions. So it's not to say that he wasn't the one who was deciding like, Oh, like let's add some reverb here and a little bit more reverb here. Um, so it's not to say that he didn't have control over what was going on. You know, it's very possible that it was fully his decision to add in that that amount of reverb at times. Absolutely. And I think, it. yeah, you're right. It's cool to have it at certain moments more than others. And maybe they just add that in after the fact um, post-production. So that does make the most sense to me. Any other questions you have for me or shall I go on? No, continue. I just wanted to I wanted to get your opinion on that. <laughs> well yeah i do have an opinion on it i i will say i i need to learn more about those sorts of things but generally i don't want that much reverb i want a little bit um and at times maybe more and and if you're making a recording you can make those additions mm-hmm. post-production yeah so that's the cool thing about that um as I was saying, Grant Green's solo occurs. It's characterized by a lot of well-placed lines that are not just bop, not just blues, or just chromaticism. But he connects his ideas quite well. 358 to 408 is a prime example where he has an idea revolving around a short goal note that he continues to proceed with a larger number of notes as he develops that idea. Um he does that quite a bit, and I Quebec does that a lot in another solo that we'll talk about. The whole solo is made up of single lines, again, no chordal movement, nice double time bop lines, um, pretty much 16th notes to end his solo. Um, and then the sax enters in at 455, and right at 459 to five minute mark, there's like an audible sort of cut in the mix, and it seems like they cut a lot of Ike's solo out. Um, because it seemed as if he was getting a little bit more intense in his playing and I was kind of getting excited to hear where he was going to go. And then it immediately cuts to a softer phrase. And I think that cut is very evident. It seems like there's an edit here. Maybe it's a cut from another take that they're using and they're combining two takes together. Did you hear that? What did you think of that? Yeah, I, I did hear that. And I think it's interesting. I'm not a huge fan of doing that of like Frankensteining tracks and like cutting the ending of one track and adding it into the other. Um, but yeah, yeah. it just, it just seemed to jolt out at me and it, it kind of, I don't know, sort of ruined my mood at that moment. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. And it's definitely, it was way harder to do back then than it is now with like how far that's like studio production and recording has come. So it's really hard to make it seamless in that kind of, situation you know in that i mean they're they were great back then but the technology that we have now like we could literally you know be like all right we're starting back on beat one and it could sound like the exact same song you know nowadays um with technology and all the equipment and the just the software itself and the programs but yeah that definitely is kind of it's kind of weird and i'm not i'm not a huge fan of of doing that of like putting two takes together right and, and right after that little cut happens, it sounds as if it's the head out again. It's overall a nice sound that we get from Ike Quebec, and he's playing a little more busily or busier playing, I would say. I like busily more. <laughs> yeah, busily is not a word, but I'm making it up. <laughs> um, he does a low B-flat honk at 530 that I really like. That just stuck out to me. Um, and that is immediately followed by busier downward lines and some high notes as well. And there's some really cool short articulation that he's doing at 555. The 606 mark starts a cadenza with some chiming in from the rhythm section for a brief second. Some nice quick fluttering brushes I'm hearing at 625 to 630. And Ike takes it and plays with the lower register of his horn. We get that breathy tone. It's very tasteful. It's not overdone, and there's some cool triadic movement he uses at the end as the rhythm section comes back in to end it with Ike. Yeah, and just a few things that I want to point out on this track overall. I I really love this guitar intro. Um, You kind of talked about how you liked it in certain ways more than Blue and Sentimental. I really do enjoy this guitar intro, and I think that the rhythm section is just fantastic on this track. 
and they really allow Ike to just shine, which he does. I think that Ike has a certain tender soulfulness to his playing that really comes out in this ballad. And one thing is I think it's kind of can be hard for Grant to follow up um, after a solo like we get from Ike. But I think one thing that happens is the rhythm section uses dynamics really well um, to make it work and kind of follow what Grant's doing. And Grant's so good that even after a great solo from Ike, he's able to take it and kind of run with his own style and develop a solo really well. So those are the things that kind of stick out to me on on this song. Um, go ahead, Max. Yeah, that's those are great points. Uh, I just want to, I'm not sure if, uh what ike is i mean ike is embellishing the melody a lot so at moments it sounds like a solo i get i don't know am i thinking of the right thing i don't know it, it just seems like uh it's not a, a full solo to me okay but i could be i could be wrong that's about true that. yeah no, no no i don't think it's it's more of like a your typical like ballad where on the last you know time through the a or you know he's embellishing the the melody more yeah not more so than it being necessarily a solo and then we get an actual solo right but i think your point stands with everything ike is doing and the 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 sound and the approach and the overall effect and the energy and the style it's hard to to come after that and i think that's why at certain moments we get the first solos from the guitar so your point your point stands Yeah, yeah for sure yeah yeah um, cool. Well, let's get into the fourth track on the album entitled Blues for Charlie. And this is a tune that was written by Grant Green. And it's kind of a funky riff blues that kind of define this early 60s soul jazz feel. Um, Grant Green plays the head by himself, which is uh, interesting and makes sense since it's his track. Um, and one thing that's cool to note is that much of the melody is played with kind of two note uh, voicings in thirds. And this is super similar to how a piano or an organist would play in this style. Um, so kind of those bluesy double stops kinds of things in thirds, which is kind of, it sounds almost like he's emulating an organist in my opinion. And it's unique because this song has your kind of more traditional blues, uh, 12, eight feel, and it's a triplet based shuffle instead of like your your four four um, jazz blues feel would be, um, which I think that's unique and it's cool. It kind of odes to a more traditional blues feel, and maybe you know the guys like um, some of the great guitarists, you know, of the the blues era. So I think it's cool that Grant does that there. Ike once again doubles on piano, and I think his blues feel and his comping is actually really solid here. And this does a lot more for me than um, Minor Impulse did uh, when he's playing on on that track. So I, you know, we kind of talked about that earlier. I think his blues his blues feel is is really good. And then um, Green solo starts with lots of space and linear movement through kind of the blues scale. And then we get some more traditional blues riffs uh, added in and not much use of like chromaticism or bop lines really here. It's a lot of kind of the the blue notes, the blues scale that we get from Green Solo, which makes sense because it's a very traditional blues feel. Um, so but he does add in some, some chromaticism at 241 and it really stands out to me there because of his sparse use of chromaticism or chromatic movement throughout the rest of the solo. And then we get a very soulful entry by Ike Quebec, and it's just the use of vibrato. It's so unique. His style is so him, and that vibrato is so good. And the articulation and the vibrato through that first phrase are just, they're impeccable to me. Um, And then he plays a really cool idea from 319 to 322. And the thing that sticks out to me on this track is just Ike's dynamics. I mean, his dynamics are just incredible. He plays with such good range dynamically and you can really feel the emotion um portrayed by that dynamic by his dynamics um and one thing that's cool that he does is he kind of lays back a bit on the beat from uh four minutes to uh, four or five which is kind of cool um we talked about oscar really laying back on the beat and that push and pull of the the feel and it's something that you do in swing and in blues and in jazz in general um and we're getting kind of an, an extended solo here from Ike, which is nice. They kind of stretch it out a little bit. Lots of soulful blues playing. One thing that's interesting, we kind of talked about this actually. Um, it really stood out to me is uh, the amount of reverb on Ike's sax, which is um, 
I think it's mostly a production effect. I wonder if there's like any like what kind of room they're playing in, but um I think it's probably the RVG studio in New Jersey. I don't know it is. Well, I, I don't know for sure, but I would imagine. I would I imagine know. too. Um so I would imagine that it's post because if it's in that studio, then that's it's this uh, it's not a big room. So um but there's lots of reverb from uh four thirty two to four forty, like in an extended amount of reverb, which we kind of talked about. There's more reverb in certain parts than others, and it probably was done after the fact. Um, so, yeah, interesting to note. I uh, kind of almost in that section sounds like he's playing in a large church. Max, did you figure out where this was recorded? Yeah, it was recorded at RVG Studios in Inglewood yep. Cliffs, New Jersey. New Jersey, yeah. Um, and I just want to mention there's a great aspect to this I Quebec solo that you're almost getting at without saying it because those moments 319 to 322 four uh, uh, four zero zero to 405 also at 437 also 441 to 452 also 530 to 532 he's doing something that a lot of sort of swing era sensible players um, do which is where you play a lick or a few notes and then you go up or down to a different note after repeating that initial idea, building that intensity. And you're usually making the the difference of each goal note, a step or a half step. So you're doing da, 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 da. And you're, yeah, that goal, that last note of those, of, of each of those phrases moves in intensity. And he does that multiple times in this solo it's a blues thing to do. You know, a lot of great players like Sonny Stid, you can hear do that too. But I think I Quebec in this solo is a master at doing that. And that helps build his solo um, just to a, a different level. In those moments, it's sort of riff based. It's very swinging. And I love hearing that. And there's some moments where Grant Green does that too. Yeah. And I think that's just, that's a really cool technique and something that people can think about is instead of, like I want to, you know, I want to outline this part of a a scale. Like I won't, you know, like from maybe the minor third, um, you know, and up to the seventh or whatever. And instead of just like going from one place to another, you can kind of do what Max said and just use different techniques and mnemonics to get to that. Like whether it's like you know, like repeating a mel or repeating a rhythm and then hitting the note and then repeating that same rhythm up to the next note. So you don't have to just move through the scale. You can kind of approach the scale in different ways and, you know, give people some different feelings when you're moving through, you know, throughout a song. So I think that's a a really good point there, Max. Um, And then the head out on this uh, track is just it's just grant green again playing the melody and but we do get a little bit of um ike playing kind of around with the melody in the background and they repeat kind of a a tag a few times on on the way out of of this track yeah you're right and overall i'm really digging the stretch on this one i think i think i quebec gets the chance to stretch out a little bit and his solo goes on a little longer than i would have predicted um and i like that aspect of um this tune blues for charlie so that's a great track in my opinion the next one is called like this is an original by ike (laughs) like by ike like ike it reminds me of the campaign for president from dwight d eisenhower he had those buttons i like ike and so i would make those buttons for i quebec if it were me i'd make (laughs) i i like i quebec buttons (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> anyway this tune an original from ike it's a 32 bar structure with two 16 bar a and a prime sections i love the unaccompanied saxophone intro that he does he kind of just starts out in time playing and then that brings in the rhythm section other than you know doing the the usual other way around where the rhythm section brings in the sax melody mm-hmm. <clears throat> um It's a nice kind of upbeat tempo that's established when the rhythm section enters. The melody is kind of early bebop oriented and it, you know, the the way it moves, it swings really hard. If you just listen to it without thinking about form and structure and time, it seems a little chaotic. Um, It feels good, but it seems a little random. But once you listen for for those things that, that make up, you know, 
the song structure, you can hear the melody pretty clearly. And it's just more or less influenced by bebop melodies. So that's what you're getting there. And we get the classic two bar break into the saxophone solo. Um, one thing I want to say about the melody before we move on and kind of about this composition is I think it's a really good um, ode to bebop. And I really dig how this kind of brings a lot of variety to the album. We've kind of gotten through some different blues feels and the bluesy ballad. And now we're getting kind of more a bebop feel. And this reminds me, let me know if you, if you agree or disagree. This reminds me of kind of some Dexter Gordon bebop and swing infused hard bop, uh, compositions. Does that, cause that, that, that's really when I was listening to this, I was like, this sounds like kind of a Dexter Gordon kind of tune in the sixties. I think you're onto something there. Uh, it reminds me of certain moments of go yep. that we went over and it's, it's kind of like almost a Charlie Parker head, but it's not busy. It's not busy enough to it's be not a quite, Charlie it's Parker like more head. hard bop, but like bebop infused hard bop, you know, that's right. Yeah. It's like a hard bop version of a bebop composition, which is a lot of Dexter. That's why I give him Dexter <laughs> a lot, especially in this era. You're right. That's a great connection. Um, because if you listen for that and, and the way it's it's constructed, that is kind of what you're getting. Um, absolutely. I think the saxophone solo is kind of interesting to listen to. It kind of sizzles at the top of it, and then it starts to swing a little harder and get a little bit more intense as he goes on. There's some fantastic lit, licks, excuse me, some fast vibrato at the ends of his phrases, and some growling or, or sort of throat manipulation to his sound that's going on. It's a little bit more gritty. Kind of reminds me of the way Ben Webster would, would play on faster tempos or like an Illinois jacket. Definitely getting some Illinois jacket there. It's sort of the combination of swing era sensibilities plus some basic bop elements in his lines themselves um, that he's playing. Equipped with the stylistic details that really solidify and characterize I Quebec, including sort of his drawn out bendings of notes that he does. And those bendings of notes are so appealing to me. I, I just love when those moments happen. It's, it's a sense of emotion that's added into what's occurring and, a, and just a, an attention to detail and sound that makes all the difference. Also, it's cool to listen to what Philly Joe is doing. There's some great snare drum hits behind the sax solo that depicts some nice musical interaction between the two. And then we get some single lines by the guitar. We get that big, heavy tone you were talking about. Lots of eighth note lines from Grant Green. Seems like a lot of mid-range notes. So not only is his tone mid-range, but the notes he's actually doing are mid-range on the instrument. Um, so you're right about that. Philly Joe is interesting to listen to here as well. He adds quite a bit behind Grant Green. From 258 to 311, I love what he's doing. He's almost doing a, a driving shuffle beat on the snare without actually doing a shuffle beat. It's hinting at the shuffle without doing a full-blown shuffle beat. And then we get a second saxophone solo. The only thing I like more than one saxophone solo on a track <laughs> is two saxophone solos. <laughs> or Especially like a three-minute saxophone cadenza. Max could go for one of those, too. Absolutely. <laughs> And that's another connection to Dexter Gordon because on his album Go, he did quite a few second mm -hmm. solos, you know? So another Dexter connection there. Um, at 402, it seems like it's almost an abrupt cut. Another maybe edit there. You know, it, it didn't seem like it was a seamless transition from the guitar solo to the sax solo. Um, and then there... I don't know. I, I could be wrong about that. It just seemed to me, um, you know, it, it went right immediately from guitar to sax. It didn't taper off as as I expected it to. It could have been that that I just came in hot yeah. right at the end of a guitar phrase, and that's probably what happened, but I wasn't quite sure. Yeah, so, I'm not sure. I It kind of felt like that to me. I didn't notice, like, a, a cut necessarily, but it did seem like the kind of transfer from one solo to another was not the most seamless possible. Right. I, I think that's what's happening there. 
And here on this second solo, I'm getting more Illinois Jacquette um, just from his sound and his ideas. 432 to 440 is a prime example. Very swing era heavy stuff going on. 449 to 453 is a cool improv thing where you're playing a lick and going down to a different goal note every time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about that with Ike's previous solo yep. in, in the last track. And this kind of movement helps bring out the chord changes and harmonic movement while also being riff based and swinging really hard. I just love when Ike does those. And it ends with sort of a last A section, almost a repeat of the head, um, just for eight bars. And this track reminds eight or 16 bars. I can't remember. But this track reminds me of sort of the trad jazz practice of playing a melody, but not really verbatim and adding ideas to a melody um, while you're, while you're, you're playing it. So, so I kind of does that on this track and um, it reminded me of certain moments on the album Satchmo of Pasadena. Yeah. I think that's a really good connection. I think this track just kind of, it's great to hear Ike's versatility and some of those bebop chops. And then, like you said, some of the, the more straight ahead swing sensibilities. And I think uh, Illinois Jaquette is a great comparison there that really, I mean, cause that guy is that's, straight ahead swing to the max so it's cool yep. to get that that comparison especially on that second solo so we're kind of getting a little bit more range of you know sound from from ike on this one and range of you know playing style with the the bebop and the, the heavy swing there so i i definitely um agree with that and i appreciate that from ike here um but on the the next song on the album and this one is one we're going to get into it a little bit. It's called Count Every Star. It's um, a standard. But this recording, before I get into the standard itself, this comes from, we kind of mentioned it earlier, a different session, which was for the recording of Grant Green's album, Kind of, or not Kind of Blue. Why did I put Kind of Blue? Born to Be Blue. I was thinking Kind of Blue when I wrote this because I had done the our intro. Born to Be Blue. Um... So yeah, this recording comes from from that session, which had Sam Jones on the bass, Sonny Clark on the piano, Grant Green on guitar, Louis Hayes on drums, and Ike Quebec on the saxophone. So a completely different cast, minus the two you know kind of lead guys on this one, a completely different rhythm section. Um, and this it's unique to note that this recording is on both albums, the exact same recording. So it came out on this album first but was recorded for Grant Green's album. But that album, like we mentioned, didn't come out until after Grant Green had passed and it came out in 1982. Um, but getting into the song, what do you think about that, Max, about the same recording? Before I get into the, the track itself, um, what do you think about the same recording being on both albums and kind of the timeline and how it was recorded? I, I, I find it very interesting because it seems like I don't, I don't know if Blue Note knew what to do with Grant Green. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean I don't mean that disparagingly or anything. He is a fantastic player, but it just seems like they they knew when they met him and and they got him into the studio that they wanted to record him and they wanted to record him as a leader, which says a lot as a guitar player. Yeah. Sometimes when you know, sometimes when we think of jazz, we we think of jazz guitar as sort of the stepchild mm -hmm. to <laughs> you know, to any other instrument you know jazz is very horn heavy usually well, on the east coast i mean that's kind of like you get that on the west coast with west montgomery but like you don't see a lot of like solo guitar guys on the east coast george benson did some of his own stuff but later on in his career a lot of times too earlier on he was playing with you know organ trios and doing different things you know accompanying other people Right. And, and the great Cal Basie had Freddie Green on guitar as an essential piece of his rhythm section mm -hmm. that contributed heavily to the sound of their overall big band. But there's really, you know, very few of those moments in jazz history where, where the guitar was so influential. I mean, another key player is Charlie Christian mm -hmm. um, and also Django Reinhardt. Yep. And then if we think about, you know, blues heavy jazz straight ahead playing Kenny Burrell comes to mind. I mean, there's a lot of great guitar players in the history of jazz, but the instrument itself is sometimes neglected when we think about the overall instrumentation of a classic jazz ensemble. Yeah. It seems so, like there's like a bit of a reluctance to feature 
like guitar players as the head of albums like oh it's got to be you know the horn player or a pianist at time it feels like there's way more of a reluctance to have the guitar be the feature of the the album and i don't know what that is right and i think that is part of the reason why they did not release a lot of grand green stuff right away um and 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 there's other stuff i think we just don't know about the relationships but that occurred between grant green and maybe alfred lyon or whoever was involved i i don't know it just seems like they didn't know what to do with him they knew he was great and he could produce an album and and he sounded great and he had a unique um sound and and approach but it seems like they just released a lot of things after the fact and they used this track as sort of a filler for maybe that album to to release after um because it, it is a it, a great track in and of itself and features some great playing by by Grant Green. Um, so I, I think it's it, it you know it occurred that way specifically because of Grant Green and the relationship he had with Blue Note. And there's something there that we're missing or we need to research further on that that we need to get into at some point. I, I just think this is a an, an example of that. Yeah, I think we should probably do a, a Grant Green at some point soon, and we can kind of we'll do our research, do our homework, and see if we can't figure out why you know there were al- so many albums that didn't get released until twenty years after they were recorded, like Born to Be Blue. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's get into this track a little bit. So this track was written by um, Bruno Coquatrix. Trix? That's a tough name, <laughs> Coquatrix. <laughs> Um, say say that three times fast. Yeah, not even close to happening. Um, but Bruno Coquatrix, yep, butchered it again. Again, and uh, Sammy Gallup. That's a much easier name. <laughs> um, and it was first released by Ray Anthony and his orchestra, and it actually reached number four on the U.S. pop charts in 1950. Um, and there's some some other versions of this song as well. Lester Young, Sonny Stitt. And um, I or Grant Green's "Born to Be Blue," which is not another version. That's the same version, just on a different album. Um, so we've talked about that. As we mentioned, a different cast on this one. Um, we'll get some Sonny Clark on this. And this is an eighteen. It's an interesting form here. It's kind of a um, a different form. It's an eighteen bar form, A A B form, uh, based a lot around two five ones. Um. And so the intro is by uh, Sonny Clark. We get kind of a Sonny Clark piano intro, which is nice. And then the melody is played by Grant Green. And I think it's an interesting um, choice to have Ike not play on the head. And I was going to ask Max what he thinks about that. But I think Max is looking to see if this is actually 18 bars. I think it is 18 bars, though, Max. <laughs> I, I was going to look, but um, it's okay. Well, I'll go with you. I'll, 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 you I talk about you. this, and I'll look. Um, what do you think about uh, Ike not playing on the head at all, and just having Grant Green play on the head on this one? I mean, I I think it works well. It it, it kind of further proves the point we were trying to make that this album is kind of co-led by Grant Green. Um, it would make sense to me also if it was, you know, maybe it was originally intended for a Grant Green led album that was, you know, born to be blue. Um, maybe Green was the leader on the on the session. So he said, I'm gonna take the head. So if that's true, then then it makes a lot of sense that Grant Green plays the head without any um I Quebec on it. So that's that's my uh assumption with that. Yeah, for sure. All right, here I'm gonna pull up the sheet music for this and we'll Cause I don't want to, um, I don't want to misquote what's going on here. Um, here we go, Max. I'm going to share my screen with you, and we're gonna, we're gonna get to Uh-oh. the bottom of this. Um, we are uh, right here live. The, yeah, this is a live in the moment. Yeah, recorded. Uh, Here's debate. the. Here it is, Max. I think it's Ooh. these six bar phrases. So, well, it's an eight bar. Eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because the double bar, and then you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then an extra two five, so it's kind of like a seventeen bar thing, according to this. Four five six seven eight. Oh no, you're right. That's eighteen. 18. Yeah, it is you're eighteen right. bars. All right. Yeah, eighteen. Because it has a it has kind of a bar of 
of without melody in it at the very end. Exactly. As a, it's like as a 16 two- bars plus like a, a two bar kind of thing. Correct. Yep. So I'm not crazy. It's basically like, yeah, kind of like these six bar things. Yeah. Or four bar, four bar. Okay, cool. Um, So it is 18 bars. Max thought I was crazy for saying that. I was like, man, I don't know anything no, I just- about I just wanted to double check, but yeah. you're right. Um, cool. So, but it is uh, based around a lot of two five ones. Um, we kind of talked about the melody a little bit and why you know Grant Green. It makes sense knowing now that okay, this is recorded for Grant Green's album. Why Ike isn't playing on the melody? Um, so, just kind of another interesting thing about this track and including it on this this album. Um, there's a little bit lighter of a touch from this rhythm section than the other rhythm section previously on the album I've noticed. Um, and this is, uh, we get a lot of linear movement from green during his solo. He quotes the melody a lot. Um, we get just bass and drums for the first few choruses of the solo. And then Sonny comes in with some very tasteful comping. Um, Sonny Clark is incredible. You know, he's one of, just a, in this era, just one of the the greats, in my opinion. Um, and then Green kind of digs deep into the blues on his last line before Ike comes back in. And then Ike really reminds me of uh, Illinois Jaquette, his full and sultry sound, the vibrato and his approach on this solo. Um, he references the melody very often. And then they kind of they get back into the head with some whole and half notes uh underneath from ike so while grant green is playing the melody you get some kind of um some comping from ike underneath the melody and i think it's uh really cool they end this song in a cool way like kind of through the chords they extend the chords out and kind of move through the chords on this song but one thing that kind of bothers me about this track is that we get sonny clark on the album but we don't get a sonny clark solo max what what's going on what do you think about that well, if it's Green Session um, and he does what he wants, if he doesn't want a Sonny Clark solo, he's not going to get a Sonny Clark solo. And it's unfortunate, but it you know it is one of those moments where you have Sonny Clark on a recording and he doesn't get a solo. Yeah, it seems like, well, we've got Sonny Clark once on this album with no solo. It seems, that seems to be one of the things on this album that like doesn't fully make sense to me. But, it, I mean, it's just weird. The song being in the album is kind of out of place in general but it's it fits in the album well but it's just kind of you know there's a there's a unique tale behind the song and its inclusion in the album in general absolutely it's a little unexpected um and if you don't know you wouldn't know you know it it fits well because it's got both ike and grant green playing and then if you just have different rhythm section players the average person really couldn't tell or or know what to listen for to tell the difference. Well, if you couldn't tell that this is someone different on the piano, then you might well, need a little more ear training, in my opinion. What just, I mean <laughs> is... I'm just kidding. No, but the rest of the song, other than being like, okay, all of a sudden now we have like a, a piano player on the, the track, is like, that. that is definitely different. But the feel of the song and the rest of the rhythm section, I agree, you couldn't really tell. You could just think, oh, they added some Sonny Clark in on a track, you know? Right, yeah, yeah. It would depend on the listener um, and how well versed they are to be able to tell those differences and those nuances. But I, I, I think all in all, it's a great, warm feeling track. I could listen to this track all, mm. all night. You know, just on repeat. It just, it feels warm to me. And uh, it, I just also want to mention it's kind of ballsy <laughs> to have three ballads on <laughs> one album. It really um, is. And it what I guess it wasn't recorded this way. So it's just like True. So they 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 you know they after the fact thought, "Oh, let's add another ballad to the album." Yeah. Um because it's yeah, you're right. I think it's <clears throat> from a different session. And I, I again, I think they can get away with that here because of the tone of I Quebec and the musicality mm-hmm. of Grant Green. It's also a very nice Grant Green feature. Um so, and I get the sense that maybe those two were kind of friends, I can grant, mm-hmm. um, because some of the stuff on here where we're almost featuring the guitar more in certain moments, I don't think you could get away with that in other recording sessions from a different leader. Yeah, that uh, was actually something I'm going to point out in my overall thoughts is that it takes a lot of like 
self-awareness from Ike to be able to feature Grant so heavily on his album, you know, and to recognize Grant's place in the music and his ability to be able to just be like, it's, it feels like this should almost have both of their names on it, in my opinion. Like, I, it is Ike's album, but it feel like it, it could almost have both of their names on it. It could. Um, I, I do think Ike, you know, is more of a leader on it. Mm-hmm. But, but there's just a, some really cool guitar moments that feature Grant Green really well. And it is almost um, a neat aspect to the album in and of itself to have so much of a another person featured um, almost as much as the leader. So it's a really neat track. And, and I, I like that aspect of this album too. And then th- those six are the, are the, from the original album. And as the CD was released and we got sort of the digital version, we were given two bonus tracks mm-hmm. that are both to me really swinging yeah. and they're, Faster tempos. It's cool to listen to. Um, the first bonus track, so the seventh track on the CD version, is that Old Black Magic, a classic standard from 1942, written by the great Harold Arlen with lyrics by Johnny Mercer. If you don't know, Harold Arlen composed over 500 songs, including Over the Rainbow, many songs in the Great American Songbook. He was originally from Buffalo, New York, the son of a Jewish cantor, where he learned piano and formed his own band before moving to New York in his early 20s, where he was a vaudeville accompanist, uh, sorry, accompanist. And he also began composing in 1929 with his first hit, Get Happy. Harold Arlen continued to achieve success writing tunes and was a composer for MGM, and he wrote for Broadway before teaming with the great lyricist Johnny Mercer in the 40s, writing songs like Blues in the Night, Come Rain or Come Shine, and this one, That Old Black Magic. He was also a vocalist, and he has appeared with the likes of Barbara Streisand. Um, He passed away due to cancer in 1986. Uh, If you're not familiar with Harold Arlen, you better get with it, because his his writing is everywhere in this music. Yeah, and I think we've mentioned him before on the, the podcast for sure. I think so. This version of that old black magic is very cool to listen to. There's an opening intro lick from the guitar while the, um, with the whole kind of rhythm section, there's a nice hi hat that's being played by Philly Joe. And it's a cool intro groove on the upright bass that makes for a great original sort of introduction to take place. It's a very neat intro. If you don't know, this standard is one of the ones with a very long elongated, Sorry, I said long and elongated form. Just hammer it in. I'm <laughs> really pushing the point here. There's many two two bar two five ones or four bars of just one chord being repeated. It reminds me of tunes like I've Got You Under My Skin or Cheek to Cheek. It is an AABA tune with the last A uh, having an extended eight bars in it. It's usually played at a faster tempo in an instrumental setting. And here they're doing it kind of medium fast. The whole head takes a minute and 10 seconds um, in addition to the intro, which took uh, 10 seconds in and of itself. So we get a, um, a whole minute and, and some change with just the melody because of that elongated form of the tune. There's a few moments where Ike plays around with the melody here, too, you can listen for. Um, especially on the section ending turnarounds that take place from one section to another. And I think that's a, you know, I think saxophone players need to take note of those moments of certain ideas they can add to melodies at certain times. And it's really important to not get in the way of the melody when you're playing the melody on the instrument. Um, And you want to embellish it, but there are moments that make more sense where you can embellish it and, than other moments and i think the way ike does it is the way to go so i think you sh- you should take note of, of how he is embellishing the melody on this there's a two-bar break into the sax solo classic arrangement a lot of similar ideas from ike here as he continues yet it's even more impressive at the at the faster tempo and i think his faster playing has a just a a tad more grit to it, as I mentioned earlier. It's similar to a Ben Webster, but not as much different at not as much difference as the brute Ben Webster had. Um, 
But uh, all in all, Ike takes one chorus. And then we get a nice guitar solo that starts out with very distinct thematic development at the start of it. And he references the melody. This is uh, another thing to take note of as a player. Don't be afraid to reference the melody in your solo and play around with it. Don't lose track of where the melody is. And, and, and you know, it's an essential part of the tune that you're playing, whether you realize it or not. <laughs> so learn the melody and be able to play with it and, uh, and manipulate it in a lot of different ways. All in all, Grand Green has a great, unique tone as usual and many single line ideas, as we've mentioned. Ike comes back in on the head during the bridge and they ride it out a bit and then there's a fade. I think in general, this track is very swinging and it feels really, really good. I do see why it wasn't on the original album. There's some more standout moments from Ike from some of the other tracks, but all in all, it swings really hard and it's very enjoyable to listen to. Yeah, and I, I think this song is really cool. It kind of that hard bop feel here. And just like swing and grooves really hard, which I like. I really enjoy the group's treatment of this tune um, and their kind of interpretation of it. And yeah, I really like those, like Max said, I love those melody quotes from Grant on his solo here. And like Max said, don't be afraid to really refer to the melody and outright quote it and go back to it and kind of let that be kind of the basis for your solo at times and, you know, Cause that's what the song is. It's the melody. Like, you know, like let's, let's not forget what, what the song is. So good. Great point there, Max. I completely agree with that. And one thing I really like is how they come back on the bridge after Grant solo, instead of just coming back on the a section. I think that's a, a cool, um, uh, compositional or arranging technique is to come back on the bridge instead of the a section. Sometimes part of that is because the song form is so long. Yeah. You know, yep. It's You'll do one that on those... ballads sometimes too. When like yes. longer ballads, they'll come back on the bridge and you know, yeah. Yep. And then that's kind of why they're doing that, but you're right. You do, you can come in on that bridge and, and it's, it's cool. Yeah, for sure. So um, let's get into the last track on the album, which is entitled it's all right with me. This is a, a popular song that was written by Cole Porter. So cool to get something from the, the Cole Porter songbook here. And it was written for his um, musical Can Can in 1953, um, where it was introduced by Peter Cookson as the character Judge uh, Aristide, Arist, Aristide Forestier. Um, and this song is also used in the Cole Porter musical High Society as well. So there's some references in, you know, in some different Cole Porter musicals and uh, popular culture. There are many popular versions of this tune in the jazz culture and language. Um, Bing Crosby did it, Errol Garner, Ella Fitzgerald, and there are just many, many other versions of this tune as well. Um, but yeah, so the uh, the drums kind of lead us into the, the melody here. And the melody has a very, like, porter musical sound to it which is cool and it's something different to on this album we've gotten so many different things and one thing of that i love about this album is how well-rounded it is so we kind of get that kind of great american songbook kind of musical uh standard feel here and from that you know that cold porter sound which is great and um one thing that does cool is uh transition from major to minor and then in the bridge with the diminished chords uh, over the bridge i really like that um kind of you know, very typical of jazz in that time. And to get that, the diminished chords in the bridge, it's, it's nice there, Max. What do you think about that? Yeah. I was just going to mention this tune is well known for its bridge yeah. and the way different players or groups, um, treat that bridge rhythmically. You know, sometimes the bass does a lot of cool rhythmic things during the bridge. Um, and if you hear cats like Johnny Griffin play this tune, it's, it's interesting to listen for how they're playing, playing around with with the harmonies and in their improvisations and it's one of those tunes that straight ahead cats you know like ike like willis jackson gator tail jackson johnny griffin you know it's one of those tunes that they play and it's it's you're right it's really great to see some straight ahead versions of great american songbook tunes here and i, I like that they added these as bonus tracks it really completes the album in my opinion and it's i'm a little saddened that one of them was not on the original version yeah i completely agree with that i think it just gives this album more depth to it more variety which it already has so much of so i definitely agree with that and i think this is a great choice of a song to to include here 
Um, so there's a, a two bar break going into Ike solo, pretty standard there. And then we get some, like some really nice bop lines to start out from, uh, from Ike. And then like Max said, I really love Ike's treatment of this bridge. It's a little bit more motif based than lines, uh, necessarily. And I just love the lick he plays from, uh, the two minute mark to two minutes and four seconds. And then Ike has some really nice range and his texture is just really nice from, uh, 228 to 233 and then we get that grant green solo with that grant green sound um the rhythm section is kind of a little bit busy to start his solo in my opinion but one thing that i love is these guys are so experienced um that you can tell that they they pick up on it all right like okay we need to dial it back and they kind of so they dial it back to where it seems like grant wants his solo to start which is just that's awesome, and that's what you want, like that level of listening and musicianship. We get that from Philly Joe and from um, Paul Chambers here, so that's really cool. And then um, there's a lot of – it's pretty much all linear movement in Grant Green's playing, which is kind of calm. It's very common in Grant Green's playing, especially while he's soloing. And this is where I had this note. This – is kind of like Sonny Clark of the guitar when soloing. It's very similar, the linear movement um, to Sonny Clark. Max mentioned that earlier. That's a great point, Max. And I'm hearing that very clearly here in this tune. And then um, there's a cool section where Ike doubles on the piano at 405. And it's it like adds a really nice texture, kind of a dark bluesy feel to the track that's like more of a you know, a musical, um, standard. So I, I like that addition there and kind of the, the texture that it adds to the, the track. And then finally, 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 we get a drum solo from Philly Joe. We had to get one at one point. This isn't on the original album, which is kind of a, a shame, honestly. Um, it's, yeah, it's really sad, <laughs> but I love but the way here. that he, he starts out his solo with kind of like rhythmic quotes of the melody. Super awesome thing. Very musical thing for a drummer to do. He does that before he kind of fleshes it out into some more typical Philly Joe chops, which everyone loves. Max said he's well-renowned, well-loved by all the cats. So we get some of the, the typical uh, Philly Joe kind of chops going on there. And then after the drum solo, we're back into the melody once through. And then um, I love on the way out, they play the tag in the melody and then they shift it up and then back down and then they kind of hit uh, the final chord all together. I think that's a really cool way to approach the ending of this this track. Max, what do you think about about the final track on the album? I Yeah, everything you're telling us is, is spot on. I do want to mention that moment that you mentioned where Philly Joe is playing behind the guitar solo and at first... You know, he's kind of doing some hard hits on the snare drum and then he lightens up as the solo goes on and he goes to more cymbal play. You know, I think you're right. It's it, it's it's a moment of great musicality because he noticed it wasn't matching with what Grant Green was doing and it was overpowering, overbearing, and it just wasn't matching musically with everything going on around him. And this proves another point that we, you know, occasionally make on the podcast that 90% of playing is listening. Mm -hmm. You can tell in that moment, Philly Joe was not only playing, but he was listening to what Grant Green was doing and changed up what he was doing. And I don't think he intended to, but he did it to better the music. And I think that that's one thing that we like that makes jazz music so great and why we appreciate the music so much is because it's just there's this level of communication and conversation that's there in jazz that you don't necessarily get from other forms of music. And Philly Joe represents it really well. And the communication, the nonverbal, the musical communication between Grant Green and Philly Joe there is just, it's dynamite. I mean, you just like, even when something isn't like perfect, that's not perfect. That's not a range, but that's just, that's so musical. And it's just, it's why we love jazz music. So it's, it's cool to hear that, that moment on the album. Absolutely. Cool. Shall well, we move on? Yeah, let's get into that's the last track on the album. So let's get into our, our top threes and our not so hot tracks for the album. Uh, I'll take this one first, Max, and then I'll let you get into yours. My first track of my top three is the title track, the first track on the album, the 
to start out with a ballad track, Blue and Sentimental, I think that it's the obvious number one track. It's the title track. It gives you everything you need to know about Ike Quebec and about Grant Green and about this recording in general. It's great. There's nothing wrong with it. Perfect. Awesome. Cool. My number two track on the album, which is kind of could be, dis- it's like, it could be disputed, is Count Every Star, which isn't even from this session. We've talked about it. We've gone over it. Yet, I think it's such a fantastic version of that tune that I, I it's got to be in my top three. It's It's got some complicated history in the album. I understand that. But I think it it belongs in the top three. And my number three, which might be a little bit of a surprise, is Minor Impulse. I think it's just a really well done minor blues. And I think it just kind of, it you hear Ike's style so well. And I think that that's what makes Ike what he is. And I, I just love, I love that we get to kind of just really get into that bluesy soulful style and I gets to be himself. I, I really like that track. I'm kind of a sucker for minor blues if we're being honest. So um, that's my number three. It could have been a, a bunch of other tracks. And then for my not so hot track, this is I, my notes say, don't do this to me. This isn't even right that we should do this on this album. This is, I mean, we've, we've said it before. It's been hard to pick not so hot. This one was almost impossible. I almost left it blank and I had the integrity to be able to pick one eventually. And mine, I guess, is the the tune like. I don't even know why. I was just, I went and listened to the album again, and I was like, I got to pick one. And that's what I picked. I don't have a good justification for it. I never will. So that's my not so hot. And don't hurt me, please. <laughs> You're right. It was really, really difficult to pick a not so hot because every track has has you know some really great moments and some great interactions and awesome playing by Ike and Grant Green and it was almost impossible. I almost did the same. I almost left it blank, but I had to pick one too. So my my list is a little different. Uh, we do have the same number one. So my top three, my number one is Blue and Sentimental. It's so ballsy coming out hot with the ballad, but they can do it because of Ike's sound. They can do it because of Grant Green's style. They can do it because of the shout chorus that they did. They can do it because of everything that is Ike, including the vibrato, the bending of notes, the soulfulness, the 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 influence of the blues, his use of the range on the horn, vibrato, and the list goes on. So number one is clear to me blue and sentimental number two is the track blues for charlie i think some of those solos in there are superb i love everything ike is doing um i dig what grant green has to offer on that track i love the 12 8 feel on the blues too so you know if there's a if there's a blues song that's in 12 8 and you and they stretch out a little bit and there's an awesome saxophone solo that's going to be on my top three. <laughs> so that's my number two. And my number three is um, the ballad Count Every Star. It's a all in all a very warm feeling track. And I think Grant Green does shine pretty well on it. And it's just a feel good ballad that that spoke to me. My not so hot that I just had to pick because we have to do what we said we're going to (laughs) do. I picked the other ballad that I did not mention. Don't take your love for me. I picked that because of that weird cut that occurs in the edit in the middle of that. Um, And there's some moments in there that aren't quite as on point that occur as well as, you know, other moments that are very on point on blue and sentimental and count every star. Yeah, I think it's it's uh it's funny how for some albums it's so easiest for us for us to pick a not so hot, and then other albums it's almost it's like pulling teeth to pick a not so hot. So I think it's it's interesting. Um, and obviously like this album's gonna get a a good score, you know, because uh, because of that. So yeah, let's get into our. Uh, for the record, uh, blues for Charlie is was an honorable mention. It almost made my top three. Um, I can totally understand 
um, putting it there. I love that tune as well. Let's get into our, our overall thoughts and our ratings. Max, why don't you hit us first with your, uh, your overall thoughts on this album and your, your rating of this album out of 10? Yeah, I'd say I Quebec's Blue Note album, Blue and Sentimental, should be essential listening for any saxophonist or straight-ahead guitar player. There's style, swing, and swagger in everything that occurs on this album. Ike is unique in how he blends many uh, common straight-ahead pre-bop and early-bop saxophone techniques to produce his ever-present sound. An obvious adherence to soul is well-maintained, even in his busier, faster, improvisatory lines. Ike's ability to move in and out of varying ideas and the different ranges on the horn are impressive. Ike Quebec's soulful note bends, breathy ballad tone, and use of vibrato are tasteful characteristics to his approach. His faster tempo grit is well appreciated as well. It is also interesting to hear Ike's piano comping on a number of tracks speaking to his versatility and musicality. Ike's song list on this album is much appreciated, featuring an excellent rendition of Count Basie's Blue and Sentimental, as well as a couple of his originals. Green's Blues for Charlie is a standout feel-good track, too. Other players, including Grant Green on guitar and Philly Joe Jones on drums, shine at many moments here as well. Green makes a solid contribution with his introductions, single-line improvisations, and great guitar tone. Philly Joe has some nice interactions with soloists and is always in the pocket. You can hear clearly why he was many performers' favorite drummer. There are one or two moments where there is a clear, awkward cut in the middle of tunes where it seems like they spliced different takes or took out parts of solos, perhaps in order to account for time. A couple of the intros are quite similar to one another, maybe seeming a bit too predictable in some of the album's arranging. However, there are other nice arranging techniques, including the use of shout choruses and cool ballad endings. All in all, this is a very solid album. I Quebec's I Quebec left us way too early, yet we have his big four Blue Note albums to adore, this one being his most critically acclaimed. Ike's sound will continue to stand the test of time along with this record. If you are unaware of Ike's prowess, please inform yourself by digging into his Blue Note discography. You should not be disappointed. Overall score, 8.9 out of 10. Yeah, Max, I think that's all on point. I'm probably going to echo some of the sentiments that you made there. Um, But yeah, I definitely uh, can agree with a lot of that. Um, Blue and Sentimental is Ike's hallmark work and is one of the most well-rounded recordings that you'll encounter. Ike's smoky and soulful sound is not just that, but powerful and technical when need be. His range on the horn and use of articulation dynamics and different tones is nearly unmatched. His playing is emotional yet so technical and deliberate. This album covers nearly all the bases from blues to bebop and upbeat swing to melancholy ballads. The duo of Grant Green and Ike Quebec is a jazz power couple that the world didn't know it needed. Grant's blues sensibilities coupled with Ike's soulful, sultry blues approach is a match made in heaven and gives this album such a unique flavor to it. We get multiple melodies played by just Grant on guitar, which might be not might not be what you expect from this saxophone feature, but it shows Ike's willingness to be creative and feature such a legendary guitarist so heavily throughout his own album. This is exceedingly evident on Green's track, Blues for Charlie, which Green really comes to play and is his own original. The rhythm section is elite and featuring the likes of Paul Chambers and Philly Joe Jones. If there is any questioning these two players and their influence on the music, go look at their discographies and all the greats they've played with. They are two of the greatest to ever play their respective instruments, and it's evident here with the ever-swinging and in-the-pocket feel we get from the two of them. It is interesting to note that two of the tracks, uh, That Old Black Magic and It's All Right With Me, were not initially included in the first release of the album, but were added to the CD reissue at a later date. And to note that the track Count Every Star is from a separate recession uh, with a different cast and is featured on Green's album Born to be Blue. Um, Overall, all of these factors are what make this arguably Quebec's greatest work from the personnel to the versatility of the song selection and to the execution. 
and last but uh, not least, Ike Quebec Sound. If you don't know who Ike Quebec was, or if you didn't know who Ike Quebec was, now you do. Uh, my overall score on this one is going to be an 8.9 out of 10. I'm right here with Max, and that lands us squarely at an 8.9 out of 10 on our scale. So a great album here. Definitely one you need to check out. And a lot of people probably haven't heard of Ike Quebec before, and that's a mistake. You need to check Ike Quebec out. You need to check this album out, and there's other ones We'll probably do at least one of the other four at some point on the podcast. I mean, we're going to do every album in jazz eventually. Um, <laughs> I don't a, know about that. It's just a matter of time. Um, just kidding. But yeah, so definitely I highly, highly recommend checking this out. Um, just really good and really good to see what Ike's all about. It is a travesty. It is a disgrace. It is a dishonor. It is an abomination that not more, you know, that, that, Hardly anybody mentions I Quebec's name. It is disgraceful to soulful saxophone playing, to the evolution of the instrument, to the um, sort of grandiose that is Bluno Records and the Bluno label. The number of people that don't know I Quebec is way too many. Please check him out. Please listen to him. Please explore what he's about. He, he, he can offer you so much in terms of soul, blues, um style and swagger i mean when i said what did i say i said swing style and swagger is this <laughs> album and that swing style and swagger is also i quebec yeah and more people need to know them please check them out if you so dare um it it'll be good for you yeah if opinion. you like like if you like ben webster coleman hawkins jimmy forrest illinois jaquette Hank Mobley, Dexter Gordon. If you like any of those saxophone players, you will like Ike Quebec. Like, if you like anything from any of those guys, you'll like what Ike Quebec's doing. So, definitely. And, yeah, and I think it's just good to familiarize yourself with somebody that sounds like Ike. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and who knows where his influence could have gone if he lived longer. Yeah, for sure. But, all right, well, let's um wrap that up. Uh, one thing I want to mention is we do have a website it's listed in the show notes below. It's We've worked really hard on it. It's awesome. There's just so much. You can get into all the different artists. You can see our power rankings. We've got our Spotify playlist. Everything is on our website below. You can reach out to us. Send us those listener questions we want to hear from you. Um, check out our Instagram. Everything is, is on the website. It's a really cool spot. Um, so definitely go check that out. We've got a lot of cool stuff going on there. Um, but, okay, cool. Let's get into um, our episode for next week i'm picking this one out it's our uh modern jazz record and this one i think i don't know if max max have you listened to this record all the way through before i have not listened to this all the way through i know of it and i've listened to snippets but not all the way okay i'm i think this one's going to be super interesting it's very it's different from anything we've done it is uh stretch music by christian scott a fantastic trumpet player and a very influential trumpet player on of the modern jazz scene um, his name has changed recently, but he was called Christian Scott uh, when this came out. He's like Chief uh, Atunde or whatever now. He changed his name. But Christian Scott, as most people know him, we're going to be getting into stretch music. I'm super excited for this one. Um, it came out in 2015, so it's not the most recent, but it's a very it's a modern album. So uh, cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to getting into that one. Uh, Max, any any extra thoughts on that? I think it's a great pick, and we have mentioned Christian Scott's name probably five or six times on the podcast, just talking about, you know, other players that have played with him yep. or, you know, his influence in the music. So it's going to be great to really dig into a Christian Scott album, and I'm, I'm super looking forward to exploring that with you. There's going to be a lot to talk about. And we're going to get some some repeat artists from other albums. Elena Penderhues, who we've talked about a good amount, she's heavily featured on it, as well as uh, Corey Fonbill, who is the drummer for Butcher Brown, is also the drummer in Christian Scott's group. So we're going to be talking about some musicians that we've already you know gone over, some more modern musicians. So it'll be cool to hear their names again. But cool. Well, I'm super excited for that. Um, I This has been awesome talking about Blue and Sentimental by I Quebec, an album that I didn't even know that I like so much. I've listened to it before, but definitely a classic. And so 
for this episode of the Jazz Jam Podcast. I've been your host, Dwayne Gunnels, joined by my co-host, Max Levy, and we will catch you next time on the Jazz Jam Podcast. <laughs>